he honestly had a pretty good time in jail because <laughs> he had narcolepsy. Yeah. And like he slept like a shit ton of the time. He was just literally asleep all the time. I fucking love jail. <laughs> He's literally he like he didn't have shit to do. again welcome to drunk and demonic i am your host with a red hat jamie and this is i'm the guest with a black hat you're not a guest I'm you're a black host hat here. Pete, dude black hat pete yeah is that racist no no it's like a like a cia thing really i think so i think black hat is like part of the cia right it's like we're, it's a black the black that's a beret, black beret Well, anyways, (laughs) with that being said, this is going to be part three of Paul Ingram, the satanic sheriff. Yeah, yeah. I apologize for the fact that it's part three. It's Um, it's okay. We're going to get through it. You uh, you had a lot of stuff you really wanted to talk about on it, and so we did it. Yeah. I I don't know. I just like – I got into this case, and I was like, oh, this would be really cool to talk about. And then here we are, like – by the end of this, six hours into it or so, and uh, man, it's a lot more than I thought. Should have wrote a goddamn novel, dude. I, Cheers, what, what I got almost here? did. Oh, Bardstown, dude, it's fucking delicious. Our first sponsor. We're gonna go straight from the bottle. We got glasses. Let me pour some for yep. you. Let me pour some for you. And remember to talk. Big shout out to Jake are... Harden. Thanks for letting us take the glasses from Backdoor Grill. Thank you. Yep. Love Everyone you, bud. Supposed to bring people in. Stay toxic, my guy. <laughs> Stay toxic. All right. So our first sponsor is what'd you say, Pete? Bardstown. It's out of Kentucky. Kentucky. Go fucking figure. That's crazy. Kentucky <laughs> bourbon, dude. It's got this cool design on the back, but you guys probably can't see it. You can see it on this camera, though. There we go. Oh, wow. Yeah, look at that. We're all fucking professional now. Well, not to interrupt, but do we have anything we want to talk about before we get into this? I have like a very small thing that I want to talk about. Um, I don't know what your social media feed looks like, but mine is fucking full of this long legs movie. Oh yeah, for sure. Is it like every other post is long legs? No. Um, Almost everywhere I search, I see it at least two or three times a day. Dude, it, I mean like everywhere from it ranging from like, it's the greatest horror movie of this decade to like, Oh, it's straight up the next Silence of the Lambs. Like I, I heard that people are puking. Phenomenal, 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 phenomenal shit about this movie, and it's got me excited. But also, if the marketing is this fucking heavy on the movie, I feel like I'm gonna be let down. Yeah, like I was telling you earlier, that it reminds me of Smile. Where everyone like where they just had people like in crowds being like, but that was cool as shit. I thought that was awesome, but then I like thought this was going to be the best horror movie, and it was just another horror movie. So I like Smile. You didn't like Smile? I liked it. Okay, I just, you didn't think it was the greatest horror exactly. movie I've ever seen, but I didn't expect it to be the greatest horror movie I've ever seen. Well, that's the way that they built it up to be, kind of like they're building this one up. Did they see? Mm-hmm. Like, I think that like Smile was like, oh, this movie is going to be cool and it's going to be creepy, but like, I don't know, I. For some reason, I just keep getting like all of these people that are reviewing this movie, and it's mm-hmm. like some video reviews, some like excerpt reviews of people, and like mm-hmm. everyone is saying that this is straight up going to be the greatest horror movie I've ever seen, and I'm starting to think that it's actually going to be trash because they're it was, marketing it so hard. Well, what did they do? They did it with uh, Hereditary too. Yeah, but that movie was fucking badass. Yeah, it was good. That movie definitely. I'm also. Up to it. I feel like I get a lot of Maxine. Do you not? I've been getting some Maxine. Yeah, I get a lot of Maxine. Yeah. But like, I get like a reasonable amount of Maxine for the end of the trilogy, mm-hmm. right? People that like horror movies, like this movie is not even out yet, and it has nothing that's really like setting it up. I just for and maybe it's just my feed. I don't know if you guys 
out there are the same way, but I am getting nonstop like stories and like check show times and like obviously the closest theater that's showing this movie is a hundred miles from us. Oh, it's not it's not gonna be in no, no, we gotta go to Fort Collins. Um, it's ninety six miles to the AMC in Fort Collins. It was the closest uh, theater that we can even go see this movie. Fuck. Well, I'll be in Denver. I have to talk to me. I'm trying to think. So that that week that it opens up, opening week, July. Yeah, it 12th, comes out the 12th or the 11th. I the 12th. Remember, yeah. Uh, I I am driving to Montana the next day, so I won't be able to go that weekend. That's. I mean, I I think this this might be one that we have to. We're obviously going to see it at some point because yeah. I can't avoid it. Yeah. Um. This, well, I feel we probably do a review on it. Yeah, we'll do a review, but it might be something like hopefully it goes to streaming soon. Or I don't something. think it will. I think we're gonna have to go watch it somewhere. Which I kind of like. It sucks that I have to go fucking watch it. Like I have to drive like three hours to go watch it. But like I'm kind of fucking pumped that it's not going to streaming because I feel like for whatever reason they're just like, oh, the movie's in theaters for two weeks and then you can get it on streaming. It's like, oh, I think I'll just fucking you chill. Know what? I was really hoping that they would do that with a violent nature since that didn't come to Steamboat yeah. either. And it's been out for over a month and it's still not streaming. So again, I'm not, I, I, I'm I also bummed that I don't get to see it, but I'm not bummed by like the theory behind it. Like dude, keep the movie theaters alive. It's like, I, I agree. That's why these movies are. So awesome. yeah, I guess we'll figure out a time not on cameras. To figure out when we'll watch this. Yeah, we didn't talk about this at all yeah. beforehand. No, we didn't. Um, I don't want it to be like Abigail, where it like comes out like a month and a half after the movie came out. <laughs> even though like no one watches this shit, so it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we'll see. I'm gonna be down in Denver in a week and a half. What dates? Uh, I think I'm down the twentieth and the twenty first. Shit, dude, I'm down the twenty first. You want no effects? Yeah, I'm going to no effects. You going to no effects? I'm going to no effects. Me too, dude. Yeah, I might be able to swing it like that Monday night after no effects. Unless, are you driving back Sunday? Night? I got to work Sunday. Isn't su- oh, I'm going to no effects on that Sunday. So you're going Saturday. So I won't be I'm there. going. You're not going to Saturday? Fuck no. What? Why? Because I didn't want to. Face to face. Because then MXPX. To- mm-hmm. I don't seen, need to do this on camera. No, you're right. No, because I wanted to see Teenage Ball Rocket. <laughs> okay. That, it's yep. The one I knew that like, yeah. yep, that's the only one I would want to see. Exactly. Okay. All right. So we just talked about a bunch of punk rock. And now, what else? You want? You all filled up on long legs? I think I, I talked enough uh, about long yeah. legs. I don't know. I'm excited to see it. I think it's been a while since I've seen like legitimate hype this hard around a movie. That's since, a horror since movie. last year when they did it with smile and smile, now they're but now they're, they're, they're I like I, I don't know I think it was fine it was just fine smile I think the marketing behind smile was awesome yes. it was it was super unconventional you just had like people showing up to like sporting events just like staring into the camera fucking acting real weird and I thought that was kick ass I thought it was brilliant marketing yep I, I like it to top it yeah so yeah going back to like you know like our Blair Witch series and shit like that like good like off the beaten path type marketing that like creates some cool mystique around a movie awesome this one is not that it's just straight up traditional marketing but with an insane budget on it yeah like because like that's not a isn't huge budget like you buy a fucking isn't ticket someone you... like like a like some actual actors in it yeah they're all actors but i feel like it's someone with like a big name like, well nick cage is in it nick cage, yeah nicholas cage and then uh the girl from uh it follows it's i don't know what that mia is something mia goff no it's not jerry goff. goff's sister it's not <laughs> that's a callback shout out to our longtime listeners of two months Yep, big time micah monroe yeah, you were way off. Yeah, I was talking to JD about this the other day, and he was like, oh, dude, yeah, she plays a really good part in this. I'm like, how do you even know this? Like, my guess is that he's already somehow seen it. Yeah. And he just doesn't want to spoil it. So, anyways, um, he was like, oh, yeah, dude, she's going to do super good in this movie. I bet she, like, she plays like a kick-ass, like, detective chick. And I'm like, how do you even know this? He's watched a lot of horror movies, dude. He's seen more movies than I can even imagine. 
we're talking about our friend JD, who oh yeah, we didn't clarify knows horror. You just like we're like, hey, let's not bring up any like personal. <laughs> per- let's not bring let's up not anyone personal, personal on the podcast. Shit. And we're so you already brought up all the almost everyone that we talked to. Everyone about. that we shouldn't yeah. even mention already. All right. So we're doing great. You just get, get what else we got here? Um, I do have something to bring up. There was one of our uh, viewers had a bone to pick with you. With me? Yep. They think you're full of shit. Like I, I poop pretty regularly, so I'm, I'm not like totally full of shit. No, not, not like act, literally full of shit. They think the way that you're speaking on camera, you're full of shit. Okay. Is it you? It's not me. Are you not gonna, a viewer. Are you no. going to name drop? No, I'm not okay. going to. The viewer is asked to be nameless. Okay. But, so, would you like me to preference what I'm talking about? No, I'm good. Okay. I'm just well, kidding. Anyways. Please <laughs> continue. What are we got? What are we so, talking about here? A couple episodes ago, do you remember when we talked about the active Austin serial killer? Yes. And then you brought up that you think it is the smiley face killers. Correct. Correct. This viewer thought you got that misconstrued with the happy face killers. Which there's a doc whole documentary on that where that person those people or that person was caught. So they were saying that you had your information incorrect about saying that this active serial killer in Austin could be part of this serial killer because that serial killer was already caught. And that what I and I I stood up for you. Okay. And I said, he, he said the smiley face killer. I did. 100%. And then this person said, oh, I think this is the happy face killer I'm talking about, which I didn't really have anything else to bring up because I don't, I fucking heard of neither of these. So. I was wondering if you have heard of the happy face killer uh, or care to elaborate. I honestly don't know. I have not heard of the happy face killing. I'm looking it up right now. Um, computer club. Okay. Uh, so the happy face killer is definitely has been caught. Um, and he drew smiley faces on letters that he sent to the media and to authorities. I am not talking about that case. I am talking about the smiley face killings, which is if you type in the smiley face killing killings, not killer killings. It's not one person. I can guarantee that. Okay. I think it is a group of people that are across the entire country, all going all the way from Brooklyn, New York, there are cases, to uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, Just the United States? Yeah, literally all across the United States. I guess I haven't really looked at other countries, uh-huh. but um, the smiley face killings deal with primarily men that are found – uh, in water, like the, usually after like a night of drinking, this is, I'm like summarizing an MO here, okay. um, found in water, drowned, and then somewhere near where they're found, like spray painted on a wall or a rock or like there's like a smiley face somewhere near either where a victim is put into the water And they estimate that, uh, yeah, he would have traveled this far in this many days. He would have come out or gotten into the water Uh, here. Um, So this is a separate case from the happy face killer, which I don't actually know anything about. It's the first time I'm hearing about it. Um, But the smiley face killings is never been proven. Uh, There are definitely a couple books that are out there, a couple documentaries that have been done, um, and one really, really bad movie. Can you name drop some of the documentaries? Do you remember them? Or at least the movie? Uh, It's called The Smiley Face Killings, uh, the movie. Um, Smiley Face Killers came out in 2020, um, and it is literally just about this one guy who gets picked up from his house after a night of drinking, And in the movie, and this is honestly like kind of what I think may be happening. um, It ties into this episode, actually. Um, It's a cult that is sacrificing people to their God 
and leaving them in the water and then put it like tagging these um, smiley faces at the places that they're putting them in the water. Okay. Uh, but there's hundreds of these cases that are tied to the smiley face killers or killings. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so I was right by standing up for you and being like, hey, dude, I think you're talking about two different killers, which you were. For sure. Yeah. Yep. So, and why I blame media like everyone else does. Why is media naming one happy face and one smiley face? That's too close. That is pretty close. Yeah. It's too close. You got to get more original than that. So like, these The smiley face killings, I think, go back to the mid-90s. Um, I don't know how early the the happy face killings go, but no, me neither. Yep. All right. Well, that that was all I had to talk about. Okay. Yeah. I still might be totally full of shit. Don't trust Ooh. anything we say yeah, here. We, we are we, just we, we, a couple guys getting drunk and talking about dumb shit. True. So That's what we do. please don't take anything we say as literal fact. Please fact check the yeah. internet's out there. We don't use it that often. Because that also is very credible. The internet. Use your sources wisely. Well, like Newsmax. Newsmax for everything. Yeah. One America News. <laughs> one America. I don't even know oh, that man. one. Oh, wait. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Same, same. Yep. Um, all right. With that being further ado, I say we cheers. Ooh, Are you ready? Cheers. To- uh, we've got Happy Dad sponsoring me again. Oh, I forgot. Jamie's got his Modelo over there. Oh, I almost didn't talk about sponsors. Uh, I'm sorry. It's the same shit. That's why. It's the same it's thing the same as last shit. time. It's still not any better. It's just I haven't drank any since the last time we podcasted, which was literally over two weeks ago. Well, I can These tell you. These things fucking suck. I can tell you this. Modelo's? Slaps. Yeah. He picked those up tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I've, it's not my first time, as you can see. I had it last time, and they're that good. So I'm sorry that you choose to have bad ones. Yeah, it's been about a month that I've sat on a twelve pack of fucking seltzers. Well, just maybe, maybe get something different, buddy. Yeah, but I don't, I don't really like beer that much. Then why do you, then why do you get this? Just get fruit smash. That's what you like. You like fruit smash. Yeah, but I'm trying to, I'm, I'm diversifying, dude. No, I'm trying to but, show up here, trying to promote uh, some things. We're literally looking for sponsorship deals. Um, if you got good seltzers, send them to us. Yeah. You got a, You got an address that they should send it to you? No. I can't. I'm not going to send my address on this. That's, <laughs> that's very fair. If you want to send us shit, please DM us yeah. on Instagram, and that'd be super cool. And we'll give you <laughs> big shout outs. Yeah. Not like you guys need to fucking feed us more booze, but. Not according to the people close to me. <laughs> The closest people to me tell me maybe I don't need as much yeah, booze as I have. Precisely. <laughs> All right. I'd say that we're Cheers. ready for fucking. I'm ready, dude. Let's three, fucking dude. let's hear it. Yeah. All right. Are you not entertained? Bid for to their ado. Three, two, one. Tom. I thought you were going to say action. Tom. All right, so we're going to pick back up where we left off on the last episode. Where was that? Sandy Ingram had just fled Thurston County. She had a bad conversation with Pastor John Bertoon, the assistant pastor at the Church of Living Water, where she attended with all of her family. Sandy felt completely alone, seemingly abandoned by her church and ostracized by the community that she lived in in Thurston County. That's rude. Yeah, it fucking sucks. Dick. Like... We're not going to get into the Sorry, whole religious I'm, thing. I'm here to banter. No, yeah, I, I'm here I'm for like, the banter. That's it. No, I think you're you're right on. Rah, rah, rah. Yeah. She's like, hey, like I'm a weird church person. We're doing this like Pentecostal thing, and even they're like, hey, you're like kind of too weird for us. We speak in tongues and talk to the literal God. You're a little weird for what's us. The non, what's the non literal God? Buddha. Well, I mean, you look at most religions and they don't actually believe that they're communicating directly to God. They're like really? putting prayers out there and stuff like that. But like they believe that like God channels through them. The only person I know that knows Genesis is, or is Genesis knows Jesus. That's it. What? <laughs> is that a Phil <laughs> Collins reference or something? Sorry. It was, but I, I, I fumbled on the words. It's good. I wanted to say. The only person I know that knows Jesus is Phil Collins. And I said, the only person the Genesis is Jesus. <laughs> I said this shit all backwards, dude. 
That's my guy right there. I got the brain dump. I'm not yep, even drunk. Yep, yep. I'm not that yeah, drunk. We literally, we're going into this totally sober. Which is pretty wild. <sighs> Damn near. We'll see how fucking drunk we get by the end of it. I'm sleeping in the van, baby. <laughs> Sandy's left. She went and stayed with her parents. They live over in Spokane, Washington. Mm-hmm. So literally Thurston County, Olympia is like mm-hmm. on the coast. Yep. She's driving four hours inland over to Spokane. It's going to be further than that. could be. I don't know. I, I'm trying to remember the notes from last time. I don't have them on this one. But she also, depends, like, I don't know if you on remember, which way you like, go, but it's, it's a far drive. It's, it's like across the entire state. It's literally state. the entire state. Spokane's oh, it's, like it's, half an hour from Coeur d'Alene. No, they're like right. They butt up right next to each other. Yeah. So it's literally across the entire state. Also, she said that she never drove ever on the highways and she had to drive the entire time in a fucking blizzard which is crazy i guess that's jesus take the wheel fair i guess that's what she did all right um the other thing that we had discussed at the very end of the last episode um erica had just finished an interview with detective vukic in which she detailed horrendous assaults and alluded to the fact that on several occasions erica would be shit upon after being abused This sent Vukic into rage mode where he started running down the hallways of the police department yelling the son of a bitch shit on her in reference to her father, Paul Ingram's accomplice, Jim Raby. We're going to drop back into the story on December 20th, 1988. Sandy returned to Olympia to again visit with Pastor Bertoon. This time the pastor was kinder and claimed that the 20% of her that is good is what brought her back home and that the side and the, that was the side of her that was trying to remember these abuses for whatever reason, Bertoon was very, very closely involved with the case. And he revealed to Sandy some of the new confessions that Paul had made in the days since Sandy had been gone. Many of them were satanic in nature. The primary source I used for this entire, all of these episodes didn't include the interviews and where Paul claimed these things, And I also haven't been able to locate them. But one of the confessions involved Ray Rish's former girlfriend, who Paul was claiming was a high priestess of a satanic cult. Mm. He had remembered having sex with her. This is Paul. Remembered having sex with her in a barn after a ritual in which he had signed an oath in blood and pledged loyalty to the cult. So he remembered that. I think... Allegedly. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of these going on throughout the entire episode. Bunny ears? Yes. Cool. Put them on top of your head. No, no thanks. Uh, allegedly. Okay. Should be allegedly. pretty much like prefaced before any statement that's made in this entire episode. Yeah, because yeah. as we'll get to near the closing of this episode, and like we've talked about before, all of this shit may or may not be real. We'll discuss that at the end. Is this real life? Or is this fantasy? That's it. Five All seconds. Right. We don't right. it. Sandy was shocked by these revelations that Paul had had about Jim Raby's former girlfriend being a high priestess of a cult. Paul also had stated that Sandy had had sex with Bray Rish. When John Bertoon asked her if this had ever happened, Sandy initially denied the incident, then hesitated and began crying, screaming, oh no, oh no. Sandy then began piecing together memories of the events. Okay, let's hear it. The first memory Sandy produced to Pastor John Bertoon was reminiscent of the scene that Paul Ross had described. However, she had claimed it was Rish, not Raby, who was having sex with her. Do you remember this in the last episode where yes. Paul Ross, his first born son had like come into like, he heard noise and he came down to the room and his dad like punched him in the face. And then he became an alcoholic that same night. Yes. I okay. This was That's from, like, there was, a, this was from episode one. Or episode one. I think it was episode one, two. Part one. It was part one. No, it's definitely. Part okay. One. But either way, a long fucking time ago. Um, Anyways, this is a callback to that. So that was the first memory that Paul Ross, similar to what he had described. However, 
Paul Ross said that it was Jim Raby, but Sandy said that Ray Rish was having sex with her. She failed to mention being bound and also claimed that Paul was by the door standing guard. As Bertoon pressed her for more information, she then remembered another scene where she was tied up on the living room floor and Jim Raby was there naked and in her words claimed he was howling like a dog on all fours. Jamie, can I get your best horny dog howl? How was it? That was really sad. <laughs> Why? That you was mean it was really a... sad. <laughs> no horny. Yeah, I think dude, of like a horny dog. Dude. I was. I was just horny. <laughs> horny dog, dude. <laughs> 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 I'm not your fucking monkey, okay? Okay, fine. Not your papa. All right, let's move on. She also remembered a time when Paul had her in a closet and was beating her with a stick of kindling. Paul then pushed her out of the closet, at which time Raby and Rish both had anal intercourse with her. She relayed that these events must have taken place before 1978 because that is when the couple had been reborn into the Church of Living Water, their Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. This all had to have happened before that with all these confessions made to John Bertoon on December 20th in a letter from Sandy to Paul, she claimed, I'm not remembering anything, but with God's help, I will remember. She also expressed being afraid of Paul and was asked, was I controlled by you referring to Paul getting back into like the mind control mm -hmm. stuff that we talked yeah. about last episode. Paul Ingram was transferred to a jail in another county in late December of 1998. Or 1988. Sorry about that. 98 again. What a year, though. Yeah. I think so. Pretty uh, Spears, baby. What was that 99? I'm been. sorry. Yeah. Go on. Sorry to interrupt. All right. Without the daily encouragements from Bratoon and constant interrogations from detectives, Ingram began to become confused about the memories that he had produced. He asked for a sexual deviancy test. He took this test three separate times. One for his state of mind before the arrest, once for the time before Bratoon came and delivered him from demonic spirits, meaning apparently John Bratoon had come in and done an exorcism on him. And okay. then the final one was for his current state. I don't know how Paul is able to like compartmentalize and just like keep all of these individual pieces of himself. Like be like, yep, I was this way before and now I'm this way. And then I was also this way right after mm -hmm. the pastor came. I don't really get how any of that fucking worked, but I don't, anyways. I don't get what a sexual deviancy test is. I think they're, <laughs> they're asking about like violence and Shit like sounds made up. Yeah, oh, for sure, dude. It's the fucking 90s. It's the 80s. Technically, it's the 80s. <laughs> what, 88, right? No, no, it's like 100% the 80s. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, like, I don't know. They're, like, with all of this case, figuring out, for the most part, like, the psychology of sex. And that plays a huge role in all of this entire case because the people in it are totally all fucked up and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. you don't say they're like, oh, like, <laughs> you know, you have all these like super conservative people that are also super fucked up. And I don't know. It's just a weird fucking story. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> after these sexual deviancy tests, did you get them at where did you get them at Walmart or something? Like, where did you get yeah. these? Like, no, no, there was a who did the pastor. Oh, the psychologist. Well, okay. actually. No, it was not a psychologist that came and gave it to him. It was another pastor came in and administered these tests. So this is all made up by the church. Too. 100%. Yep. Um, so we talked about he took it three times. The first time, again, mm -hmm. before his arrest, right? Mm -hmm. The second time was before Bertoon came and gave him an exorcism. And the third time was for his current state. The second two showed extreme significant sexual problems and deviancies. What do you think? What do you think happened? He's making all this shit up, dude. Oh, that's what happened. Never called that. <laughs> 
<sighs> at this same time, all right, Raby and Rish were being held in solitary confinement, being that both were members of the law enforcement community and is incredibly dangerous for cops and ex-cops to be in general population in prison. Yep. Raby. Don't kill him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Duh, pig. Specifically Jim Raby. So mm-hmm. like Ray Rish was a mechanic. He was involved with police. He never got anyone in trouble. But Jim Raby had sent lots of people to jail uh-huh. being a sex crimes investigator. He honestly had a pretty good time in jail because <laughs> he, he had cool. narcolepsy. Yeah. And like he slept like a shit ton of the time. <laughs> He was just literally asleep all the time. I fucking love jail, when baby. He, when he literally, he like, he didn't have shit to do. He was just sleeping the whole fucking time. <laughs> God damn, finally. No one to bother me. <laughs> I'm just... It's literally why he had to retire from being a detective is because he was like fucking falling asleep <laughs> yeah, in the no middle sh- of fucking interviews. No shit. <laughs> I've never heard of a narcoleptic cop. All right. Well, you learn, you you learn something new so every he day. Had, like, honestly, a pretty solid time in jail. Yeah, um, sure. When he wasn't asleep, he was investigating his own case mm-hmm. as a previous sex crimes investigator. Um, Ray Rich, on the other hand, had a really tough time in prison. He lost 40 pounds, which is good for him. But when was he, he went f- into prison, was he a big old fatty before that? Apparently, I don't yeah, know. I guess so. We, got 40 we can, we'll throw yeah, pictures. Yeah, getting... um, he had jet black hair when okay. he went into prison. Oh. This is only like a month in. I, right? I assume so. He had all of his hair had gone white. Um, and it seemed that it was quite possible that he had had a stroke um, because he was having difficulty speaking mm-hmm. and hearing. Yeah. Um, he couldn't form sentences and, uh, I think that he just straight up was stressed over the edge to the point that he like gave himself a stroke because Jeep. he was too fucking stressed about literally being a satanic oh. worshiper and raping and murdering people and or, children or lying about a bunch of shit too. Yeah. Potentially that. Oh, yep. I think it was the raping. Yep. Depends. Mm-hmm. All right. On December 30th, Vukic had another interview session with Erica and Paula Davis Paula Davis is Erica's friend who served as a liaison between her and the detectives for most of the interviews that Erica sat in for. Erica again wrote her statement, didn't give this directly in words to detectives. um, And it reads as follows here. Jamie's going to give us a fun. She's 23. Um, She is. Why? I can't read like this. You got your best 23 year old uh, chick from Seattle. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jamie. From the time I was about five years old until the time I was about 12 years old, I remember being carried from my bed by my father in the middle of the night. There were many people there waiting outside by the barn. Some of them were Jim Raby, Ray Rish, mom, dad, high priestess in a robe. These people were white, red, and and black. There were many men there and some women. They chanted as I carried it out. It was cold out in the middle of the night and all I wore was a nightgown. Just a nightgown. My my mother walked in with us to the barn from the time to, I was taken from my bed until the time I was in the barn. There was a table inside the barn. There was also a fire. All the people around the table, including my mom and dad, wore a gown. A hat that resembled a Viking hat with horns. There was a lot of blood everywhere. There were pitchforks in the ground. With the sacrifice, they would lay it in. They would lay it first on the table, and then the high priestess would pick it up. All the people would chant. Plus, the women would say words. Then the baby would put on the table. All the people, including my mother, plus father, father circling the table, would stay within until nice until it died. They continued to do this for a long time, sometimes even after it was dead. Then they would all walk to the pit and chant with the high priestess and would carry the baby and put Let's the baby into abs. something. Let's shut, go shut, the, shut the fuck up. <laughs> While they were torn the crown, then they would bury it. 
This baby was a human baby, about six to eight months old. Sometimes they would use it. They would use aborted babies, and they would tell me, and this is we happened to me also. They also would say, you will not remember this. They would say it's over and over with the chance. You will not remember this. You will not remember this. Let's go, Fs. Let's go, I don't think, I don't think you should mock this little... I don't like mocking this little girl, dude. Why are you poking fun of this girl? First of all... I'm just saying, dude, they just did some chance. No. You know, this, this is traumatic... This is traumatic shit for this girl, and you're making fun of it. I'm not. Yes, you are. You're nope. a dickhead. First of all... Way to go, also. Oh, thank you. Was that traumatic? I know, I went into it. Um, I don't... Did they believe this story? Did who believe this story? The, the cops. Oh, 100%. Do you want to just go right back into it? No, I want to know, like, I've never in my days heard of... Or do they just like grab aborted babies? Oh yeah, yep. That's part of the part of the story now. All right. Yep. Let's go in. They source babies from all over the place. Some were uh, part of the cult. They were also just right. like went to the local hospitals and just grabbed babies right. that were aborted. Yep. Yeah, you get to be here like multiple times. Why do I have to be the shitty? Like, why do I have to be like the like controversial? Ones? I'm including you. You also get to be other cool people, like Julie Ingram. Is Erica, Paul not, Ingram. is Erica not cool? Uh, Erica's cool. Julie's cool. Er, Paul's cool. You get to be this uh, guy. Paul's not cool, dude. <laughs> Anyways, we All just right. went through that whole statement. The only reason we bring that one up, it's incredibly important because it is, in fact, the first time that anyone in the Ingram family, besides Paul himself, has broached the topic of satanic rituals. But Paul's accounts never included human sacrifices. Okay. Erica also drew the detectives a map indicating where ceremonies were held and where babies were buried on their own property. A week later, Detective Laura Lee Thompson interviewed Julie Ingram and asked her about the revelations her sister had made. She admitted that Erica had told her about the satanic stuff. Satanic stuff. Yep. When Thompson asked if Julie remembered anything like that, she claimed that she remembered burying animals, cows, goats, and chickens. Uh, that shit happens on a fucking farm. I'm just going to say that. What? Burying chickens? Chickens, goats, cows. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. Okay. Um, Julie also could not say that she remembered any parties with people in costume taking place or any ceremonies besides church. She also made sure to include besides church. Besides church. Yeah. Bitch. Thompson. (laughs) No, straight up. Like, oh, like, have you ever been to any weird ceremonies where people start chanting and doing weird shit? And she's like, oh, yeah, I've been to church. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Thompson then asked Julie if she had any marks or cuts on her body, to which Julie claimed she did. Thompson's report reads... I noted two light cuts on the right arm and two round marks on the left arm. These were small round marks similar to burn marks. I inquired about the cuts on her upper arms, back, and legs. She wrote down, yes, that there were injuries there, and I asked how these wounds were inflicted. She wrote down, with knives. I asked who did this to her. She wrote down, Jim Raby and my dad. Julie then put her head on the table and began to cry. Thompson asked if she might let her see these scars, but Julie adamantly refused. The sister's inability to talk about their abuse created trouble for prosecutor Gary Tabor, a deeply religious religious conservative who was born in the Bible Belt of Oklahoma. He was the chief prosecutor in the case against Raby and Rish. Tabor was confused by the reports that detailed satanic angle and the entire case. He felt that this would mislead the jury and disregard the statements made as completely false. He just wanted to keep the case simple and stay away from the satanic angle, as any good defense attorney would be able to poke holes in his arguments with the vast amount of inconsistencies in the statements that the girls had made. I would like to commend this man for not foaming at the mouth at the chance to charge someone with satanic ritual abuse and just do his job in the best way possible. Even as 
he was born in the Bible Belt, and mm-hmm. it seems like that's exactly what he would want to do. He frained from that, and like, Lynn was like, nope, like, let's try to charge these guys with raping these girls. We don't need to fucking have all these sacrifices and all this other shit. All right. Also, the trauma expressed by the victims, the girls, mm-hmm. made Tabor doubt whether or not they would be capable of testifying in court. Julie, when asked if she was having trouble remembering things, replied that she just remembered things as they went along, meaning that as they were talking to her, she would just have things come to her and then she would just say it. Everyone's full of shit. They're all full of shit. We're not saying that quite yet. Yes. Oh, sorry. Maybe we are. I don't know. This is my angle though. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But no one's full full of shit. I'm definitely like totally not biased at all. I'm just presenting this case as how I see it. Fair enough. In a letter dated January 18th, 1989, so we were now into 1989, Sandy wrote to her daughters explaining that she was putting the house up for sale. Also, the money from the sale would be going to each of the children so that they could get out of Olympia and start over. She claimed that she would also be doing the same and would be going by her maiden name again. She described that she was not talking with Paul and how afraid she was of him. She ends the letter asking for the girl's forgiveness and that she had begun to remember what had happened to her as well as the girls, and she asked for their forgiveness. The letter finishes by saying, I do not understand it all or remember it all yet, but I will, and they are not above the law, and you both do not have to fear any longer. That's how she ended the letter. Wow. The day after Sandy wrote to her daughters, Detective Thompson took Julie to Seattle to be physically examined by a forensic specialist to confirm the claims that the girl had received abortion as well as severe scarring from ritual abuse. Both lawyers for Jim Raby and Rish and Ray Rish had been pushing for the court to submit uh, the girls to physical examination to verify the authenticity of their claims mm-hmm. of physical abuse. When Julie emerged from the examination, Thompson spoke with a doctor about her findings. The doctor emphasized that there was no evidence of an abortion, repeated vaginal or anal abuse, nor were there significant scars or marks present anywhere on her body. Now, the doctor did stress that, however, just because there was no evidence of abuse, specifically the abortion and the sexual abuse, that did not mean it could never have taken place. Kind of covering her bases there, I I guess. I assume so. I don't really know. She knows that it's going to a legal proceeding. It's like, I didn't see shit, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. I'm just saying I didn't see it. It also seems pretty on par with everyone else that talks about anything in this case. Everything in this case is just like, I don't know. Maybe it happened. Maybe Uh, it didn't. All right. Erica would later be examined by this same doctor, and the report would state that the only scarring noted was was from uh, acne that she had had and an appendectomy, which had nothing to do with Satan as far as I know. <laughs> they took out her appendix. Yeah. Um, and that was on record, too. Appendix. That wasn't a satanic ritual <laughs> of appendectomy. Um, that, was, that was done in a hospital. That makes sense. Yep. Uh, Thompson, after uh, the doctor had examined Erica, asked, uh, would it be possible for someone to be cut superficially and for that to heal without making a scar? The doctor replied, I think any significant cut would probably leave a scar. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Thompson also asked the doctor if she had found any signs of of abortion to which the doctor claimed that in her examination and her speak, like her speaking with Erica, Erica had denied having ever been pregnant. And in fact, Erica stated that she had never been sexually active. That's not what she said earlier. I don't really know how those two things meld because she's saying that like, She's been, like, vaginally and anally raped by multiple men at this point. How old was she? Uh, she is 23 at the time of all of oh, this. Oh, so, yeah. Um, old enough to know better. Still too young to care. <laughs> <laughs> Detective Joe Vukic met again with Erica and her friend Paula Davis on January 23rd, 1989. Erica, again, had new disclosures to make, but could only do so in writing. She described being abused by Paul, Sandy, Raby, Rish, with leather belts and sexual instruments while someone took photographs. Jeepers. 
When Vugic asked Erica about the previously claimed abortion, she became unresponsive. Paula Davis then submitted a statement she had written for Erica while the detectives were out of the room. And it reads... Sorry, I didn't give you enough cue for that. You sure didn't. Um, this is not Erica. This is Paula Davis writing for Erica. My father made me perform sexual acts with animals, including goats and dogs. He would bring the animals to me and have them perform oral licking to my genitals. Sometimes I was on my period, sometimes not on my period. Then my father would force me to have vaginal intercourse with the animals while he took the photographs. My mother was also present and also had intercourse with animals. That's why, a statement. Why, why the fuck am I... Why do you make me read this shit, dude? This is fucked I'm up. I'm trying to include you, dude. No, this is terrible. You just want me to say all the rude things. That way I'm the one that gets canceled. <laughs> I'm not trying to get you canceled, I promise. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, none of this is quote from Jamie. None of this has happened to him. He's merely reading uh, he's, witness testimony. He's setting me up for failure. Speaking of uh, testimony and setting people up for mm -hmm. failure... The trial date for Ray Rish and Jim Raby was only a few weeks away. And at this time, Gary Tabor, the prosecutor, was feeling the ground getting shaky in his case. Both Raby and Rish had vehemently denied guilt to any and all accusations. Gary Tabor also had doubts about the girl's testimony. Would they be believed and would they be consistent? Would they even be able to testify? Sandy was now making statements that implicated the two defendants, but none of the statements had concerned the daughters and only concerned Sandy herself. Paul Ross was reluctant to testify and could actually do damage to the case since he had not once made any claims about abuse to his sisters. And then finally, Chad, who had previously made statements about abuse done to his sisters, was now recanting these statements, claiming that he believed the events he had recounted were just bad dreams, just like he had said at the beginning of his in, uh, at the beginning of the investigation, when detectives convinced him that his recollections were real. The only real witness left to report uh, for the prosecution and testify for them was Paul Ingram himself. While Paul had not pled guilty at the initial first hearing in December of 1988, Tabor saw this as a routine court pleading. Paul had indicated early on about his willingness to testify, particularly in order to get a plea deal. In fact, Ingram had already been offered a deal, and in exchange for a guilty plea of nine counts of third-degree sexual assault in which prison time would run concurrently, this would mean that Paul Ingram could possibly walk out of the courtroom at as a free man having served time if he would testify against Rich, Rish, Raby, and any other person Paul might name. However, despite this amazing deal, Ingram agreed to testify and rejected the deal entirety, entirely, giving his testimony for absolutely nothing. This decision put Raby's defense attorney in an extremely difficult position. Raby's whole case was dependent upon Ingram's testimony. However, Saxon Rogers who was Raby's attorney, planned to use the fact that Ingram was getting a deal as a way to discredit Ingram's testimony. Saxon believed that Ingram had indeed assaulted his daughters, but had named both Raby and Rish in order to form a conspiracy at which he would be the primary witness in order to not have any jail time. Unfortunately, that entire argument fell flat with the fact that Paul was going to testify regardless of any deals that had been extended to him. On January 30th, 1989, Raby and Rish's attorney were granted a meeting with one of the state's key witnesses, Julie Ingram. During this interview, the attorneys received basically nothing about the case. Julie spent the majority of the time curled up under a desk, cuddling a, tutty, a teddy bear. A tutty? A tutty, dude. <laughs> Go on. Julie Just making fun of your speech impediment. Quit, dude. I'm, I'm sorry. reading all this and I'm getting freaking <laughs> I'm, lost, I'm getting dude. nervous. It's sorry. I'm going to have a drink. About time. All right. During this interview, attorneys received basically nothing about the case. Julie spent the majority of the time curled up under a desk, cuddling a teddy bear mm -hmm. given to her by Detective Laura Lee Thompson. Okay. A week later, the same attorney sat down with Erica, who was much more talkative. 
Erica detailed to the attorneys both physical and sexual abuse. She didn't deny the existence of any scarring or physical trauma, despite the clear lack of evidence, and she also claimed that she did not know of Julie's abuse or pregnancy until the detectives had told her so. Erica was asked about Jim Raby's involvement, to which she claimed to have been sexually abused at least eight times in September 1988 alone, as well as up to 50 to 100 times she couldn't remember by the age of 13. She claimed that the last time had begun with her father, then her mother, then Raby, after which each of them had defecated upon her. She did not recall any times that Rish had sexually abused her, but claimed he had only taken photos. Erica then detailed events <laughs> that had taken place in the woods nearby the Angram house. She okay. claimed there were orgies as well as the sacrificing of babies, which were then bur buried behind the Ingram home. She remarked that Rish and Raby were both present. Here we go. She also claimed that when she was a sophomore in high school, she was tied to a table. She was pregnant at the time, and those present gathered around her and performed a coat hanger abortion. Gross. Which she claimed was a painful experience. No shit. Once the abortion was complete, the fetus was cut up and rubbed all over her body. She claimed to have witnessed at least 25 babies being sacrificed over the years. You said they never found these babies? No, no, no. They didn't find any ev evidence of any of this stuff. Um, we'll get a little further into this, but uh, <sighs> there's an exhaustive search I'm of sure. the woods all over Thurston County um, because there's weird satanic groups that uh, they claim exist in uh, Washington. Makes sense. It's mostly just high school kids party. It's very wooded. Yeah. Astonished by these revelations and growing more confident in their clients' cases, the attorneys knew the pressure would be on the prosecution to secure a conviction when the news about a satanic cult was brought to the public's attention. Knowing how difficult a case the prosecution had, they approached Gary Tabor with an offer to drop the charges against Raby and Rish while only pursuing the Ingram case in which Paul would quietly admit guilt, receive treatment, and this would all go away quietly and the prosecution would walk away with at least one big win. Pretty much the lawyers for Raby and Rish were like, dude, these stories are straight up ridiculous and you're never going to prove any of this is real. Just yeah. let our guys go and take Paul. He's at least admitting yeah. to it. Just go for it. Like you're going to look like a total asshole if you bring these cases in front of the public and you can't prosecute anything. Yeah, for sure. You're going to look like a fucking failure and ruin your entire career. So Tabor, this is the uh, prosecuting attorney mm -hmm. was open to the deal. However, he needed to be sure that both Raby and Rish were just caught up in a witch hunt that they had no part in. Raby was still asking for a polygraph test. He knew that polygraphs were slightly unreliable and would not be admitted in court by defense, but knew the pressure would put on the prosecution to continue charges against a man that had been cleared by a polygraph test. All of what we just talked about seems to be a commonly forgotten part of the court system, the public. While we know that it is the duty of the court to approach the cases unbiased, when you have a case that is so dominant in the headlines, it's almost impossible to keep the case from being infected by the outside influences. Mm -hmm. On February 3rd, Raby was granted this polygraph test. There were four primary questions that were of concern to the case. The first being if Raby intended to tell the truth in the polygraph test. The second was whether he had ever had sexual contact with Julie Ingram. The third question was asking the same of Erica. And the fourth question asked whether he had made threats to the Ingram children. He answered that he intended to be truthful and then replied no to the following question, to those following three questions. To make sure that the results were as accurate as possible, these questions were asked twice. After examining the results of the polygraph, the technician indicated that Raby had lied in his response to each question. Was it me now? I don't know. I just think it's fucking what? crazy, dude. He's like, <laughs> yeah. dude, fucking put me on a polygraph. And then just like, you straight up just fucking fail the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. I don't know. I just have like, there, why, why would you ask so hard if like, you know that you're going to fucking fail it? And also what the deal like with you failing all of it? Mm -hmm. I guess this maybe goes back to your side of things where like, 
Maybe there was some fucked up shit going on. Yeah, I, I never don't said. Know. Anyways, it's at this point that we are <laughs> going to introduce the last incredibly significant character character to this story. On February second, Detective Shoning picked up renowned social psychologist from the University of California, Berkeley, Doctor Richard Offshe. Offshe's credentials included being a distinguished professor of psychology at UC Berkeley, as well as a Pulitzer Prize winner for research on the Sinanon cult in Southern California. Quick sidebar, the Sinanon cult was initially established as a drug rehab program that took a dark turn into cult territory with practices known as attack therapy and group truth telling. I don't have enough time to go into the Sinanon, but that's the brief overview. Attack therapy sounds pretty fucking aggressive where like, hey, tell us some truths. And then they just straight up fucking yell at you about it for being a fucking shitty person. Maybe not the best rehab situation. No. Sounds like uh, all those uh, like corrective children's places that they sent people in the 90s. Yeah. I think this is like it was born just out made of them Just do like this for like five hours. Do you remember that? Yeah. When the, everyone just like if you were a troubled youth, you had to go to a program and then yeah. they just like beat the fuck out of you. Oh, they just like and physically like, and mentally abused you for a year. Yeah. Emotionally yeah. tortured. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. So anyways. He did a whole lot of research into that, wrote an entire book and some papers about it, um, became a big deal because of that he became kind of like a foremost expert on cults mm -hmm. in America. Those are two things, good things to be like versed in, cults and America. For this case, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> fuck yeah, America. All right, back to Richard Offshe. <laughs> Offshe was recommended to the prosecution team as an expert on cults and mind control. Shoning briefed Offshe on the vast inconsistencies and lack of verifiable information being given by the girls. They even discussed the nature of Paul's third-person narrative confessions. Basically, Offshe was there to make common sense of the case for the prosecution. Before meeting with Paul Ingram... Detectives explained to Offshe that Ingram was having difficulty remembering all of his crimes because he had, in the words of the detectives, repressed his memories. While the detectives seemed assured that this was the reason for Paul's inability to remember things, the prosecution was not sure how strong of an argument that would be. They proposed that perhaps the alleged cult had performed mind control on Paul to not remember. This is when the prosecution turned to Offshe to help unlock the mind control that had taken over Paul. What the prosecution did not know was that Offshe had taken a particular interest in coercive police interrogation, where suspects were convinced to confess to crimes that they had not actually committed. The inability of all connected with this case to remember things clearly piqued Offshe's interest. Offshe's first interview with Paul Ingram took place in the presence of Detective Shoning and Vukic. Offshe recalled being impressed by Ingram's eagerness to help and his want, his need and want to understand his own confused state of mind. Offshe began by having Ingram lead him through the events of the case. However, he noticed that the way in which Paul spoke, described things, and remembered things didn't make sense. He felt there was something off. The human memory didn't work in the way that Paul was describing. He concluded that Ingram was either lying or was completely diluted. When Offshe asked how Paul came to remember events, he claimed that an image would come to him and then he would prey on it. He claimed that he had read about a relaxation technique in a magazine where he would imagine going into a warm white fog. Once he was inside the fog, more images would present them to him and he felt confident that these were real memories because his pastor, John Bertoon, had assured him that God would only present him with the truth. Off she wondered if perhaps Ingram's memories were simply just daydreams that he was understanding as real events. To test Offshe's hypothesis that Paul was not recalling memories, but was rather creating them, he decided to run an experiment. Offshe began. All right, you're a social psychologist. You're really, really smart. I was talking to one of, my, of your sons and one of your daughters, and they told me about something that happened. It was about a time that you made them have sex with each of you while you watched. Do you remember that? Thank you. You're welcome, dude. It, it's going right back to you, right? 
Oh, now I'm who am I? Shoning and Vukic were in the room when Offshe said this and were caught completely off guard. They were aware that Offshe had not met with anyone else besides the detective and Paul. In response, Ingram claimed to not have remembered that happening. Offshe pushed Ingram a little further and saying, This really did happen? Your children were there. They both remember it. Why can't you? <laughs> Ingram wanted to know where it happened. At this point, Shoning joined in and claimed that it had happened in your new house. Ingram replied saying, I can kind of see Erica and Paul Ross. At this point, Eric or off she, at this point off she told him not to say anymore, but to return to his cell and to pray on the matter, just like Paul had described earlier. Once Ingram left the interview room, the Texas pressed Offshe about what he was up to. He claimed that he was simply testing the validity of Ingram's memories. Later that afternoon, Offshe met with Julie Ingram. Offshe used Julie's playful nature to draw her out from her shyness and quietness, which had recently been the only mood Julie had displayed during the interviews. For the first time, Julie produced cult memories of her own. She wrote a description of people wearing dark robes and a doll hanging in a tree. When asked, Julie denied that members of the cult had magical powers. Julie retreated a little bit when off she asked about the cult keeping tabs on her. He asked how they were able to spy on her, to which she wrote, They said that a high and mighty man spoke to them and told them everything I ever said or did. That's how Julie Ingram talks. That's not how Julie Ingram talks. 100%, dude. She's <laughs> tough as shit, dude. <laughs> Off she asked if this high and mighty man was the devil, to which Julie shrugged. She claimed to believe in Satan, but she didn't know why. In this interview, Julie claimed that Paul Ross, Erica, and Chad were all children of the cult, along with a few other children that had not previously been mentioned. She also listed the name of an adult or of several adult cult members, listing those previously mentioned, as well as a few new names. The membership of this cult was finally taking place. Off she then met with Erica the next day and was fascinated by how different the girls were. Whereas Julie was dressed modestly and plain and retreated from the spotlight, Erica was all done up for, interview, for her interview and relished being the center of attention. Erica... <clears throat> off she met with Erica the next day and was fascinated at how different the girls were whereas Julie was dressed modestly and plain and retreated from the spotlight Erica was all done up for her interview I can't do that one why? I don't know off she met with Erica the next day and was fascinated with how different the girls were whereas Julie was dressed modestly and plain and retreated from the spotlight Erica was all done up for her interview and, re and relished being the center of attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Erica time, admitted one that time. she had attended 850 <laughs> rituals and had seen 25 babies be sacrificed. Off she was curious about the events of these rituals. Erica replied, uh, they chant? When he pressed her further about details, Erica claimed that she either couldn't remember any details or that they were too stressful to recount. Mm -hmm. Off she asked if her father had ever been, had ever forced her and one of her brothers to have sex while he watched. And she claimed that nothing like that had ever happened. Later that day, off she again visited Ingram in jail. Paul claimed that he had gotten clear memories of Erica and Paul Ross having sex again. Off she stopped Paul and told him to pray on the matter and write down exactly what had happened. Later that day, off she met with Sandy Ingram, who had become recalling memories through the help and counseling of Pastor John Bertoon. When off she asked how Bertoon was able to assist in the process, she claimed, he kind of prods. When we started initially, he did describe a scene to me. To him, or to that, off she replied, one that Paul has given him? To which Sandy agreed. She admitted that most of her memory sessions began that way off she asked if sandy was afraid of paul she claimed that she was not she remembers him yelling at times in her normal memory but nothing out of line off she discussed this idea of normal memory 
and what that meant. She clarified that she had a normal memory that remembered things like birthday parties and vacations, but then there were other memories that she had that had been remembered since the start of the case and claimed that these memories were different. All or most of these memories were helped by Pastor John Bertoon. In it, she detailed several rape scenes with Raby and Rish, as well as satanic rituals in the woods. She claimed... I remember being tied to a tree. There was water and fire. One time Jim took the kids by the, their heels and dumped them in the water, and they wanted me to put on a wild robe. Ray out, Ray's out there, and he's holding all the robes, and when I first saw the scene, it felt like an initiation. I went southern. Now I'm I I'm get to be sorry. Richard Offshee. Okay. Do you see the scene or do you remember it? <laughs> they're they're from <laughs> so, we're very southern. I feel like yeah. this is Seattle, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, my bad. That was my bad for starting it. Go on. Everybody says this pledge of allegiance, and they're all outside. And there's this book, book on, on the, the table. table, and this book is bleeding. And Paul and the high priestess and Jim touch it, and the blood runs all over Jim, up on his arm and all over his head, and then it runs all over me. The blood runs uphill. <laughs> that, that, that's how he asks at the oh. very end. Sandy laughs and then continues. Jim says I'm ready, and they put me on the table, and there's a leather strap around my neck and my arms and my legs and my ankles, and then the high priestess cut my clothes off with a, the knife. The knife, not a knife, the knife. Hot. I'm just going to say, Shut up, that's a hot scene, dude. That's, you, you're a pervert. What? There's nothing, pervert. nothing weird there? Per, yeah. I was just dunking some kids in water and cutting clothes off with knives? Yeah, that's... Nothing to see here. <laughs> right. By this point, Sandy had, like Paul, entered a state detectives were fam familiar with from Paul's interview. Sandy's head was rolling from side to side and her eyes rolled back into her head. Off she was able to calm Sandy down by getting her to talk about a family vacation. And recalling the vacation, off she asked if Sandy was able to remember them. And she claimed that she could that she could remember them without seeing them. She claimed that the same is not true for the memories of the cult activity. It is at this point that Sandy told Offshe that he felt that none of the cult activity had actually happened. Sandy claimed that she had doubts herself, but that she struggled with why she could see and feel the events as if they had happened when they hadn't. Offshe entered, ended the interview by asking her if she had dreams that felt real. To which Sandy replied, no. When off she sat down with Paul Ingram for the third time, Paul was beaming with excitement. He delivered a three-page confession. In this confession, Paul described a scene where he made his children have sex with each other. He also claimed that he was involved in the sex as well. He claimed that he may or may not have also had anal sex with Paul Ross, but could not exactly remember. He ended the confession by pondering on how he was able to control his children, and perhaps this control came from Jim Raby. He also relayed how he felt that someone had told him to make his children have sex with each other. Paul had in grave detail described a scene that had never happened. It showed how little pressure it took for Paul to comply and how susceptible to influence he really was. Off she then informed Paul that the entire story that he had made up was a lie, and that this confession was part of a test. However, Paul refused to believe Offshe's claimed and maintained that the events occurred and that it was as clear to him as anything else he could remember. Offshe was now entirely doubtful on whether Paul Ingram was guilty of anything besides being a highly suggestible individual with a penchant for pleasing authority. I think it is also very interesting that both Paul and Sandy were able to enter these fugue states in which they were pretty much in a trance to recall these memories. It's almost like speaking in tongues, a notable practice of Pentecostal Christianity. Offshe also believed that Erica was a habitual liar and noted how very often Julie's accusations followed after Erica's. It was Offshe's opinion that the girls never intended for their father to enter the courtroom and that he would just get a slap on the wrist. 
However, once the case was taken seriously by authorities, the girls covered up their inconsistencies, <laughs> their inconsistencies by creating crazier and crazier stories to keep detectives from actually piecing the storyline together. After concluding his interviews, Dr. Richard Offshee left Olympia, Washington, convinced that he was witnessing the newest version of the Salem witch trials. In February of 1989, both Raby and Rish were released on bail and were given ankle monitors so they were not allowed to leave their homes until the trial. This wasn't a big deal for either of them, as neither had any interest in leaving their houses to face the community that thought of them as devil worshippers and sex abusers. Richard Offshee's report was sent to head prosecutor Tabor, outlining his doubts about the truth of any of the witness reports or their confessions. Tabor refused to share the report with the court, and it was only after Offshee himself presented this case to the presiding judge that it was made available to the defense team. The report landed a massive blow to the prosecution. Both Jim Raby and Ray Risch were offered deals of guilty pleas for significantly reduced jail time. However, neither defendant was willing to admit their guilt. Meanwhile, Detective Vukic seemed to be going off the rails as his case against Raby and Risch sputtered out. At one court hearing, a private detective was stationed behind Vukic because there were honest concerns that he may just pull out his gun and shoot the two defendants. The case would then hit critical mass in the media after a ritual cult would be found in Matamoros, Mexico, in which a gang of drug peddlers appeared to have killed and sacrificed several people in dark religious ceremonies. Do you know anything about Adolfo Consanzo? Mm -hmm. And the Paulo Mayomba cult. Anyways, this dude and his friends that were all like super fucked up on cocaine. They were like little like drug lords of like the border towns in Mexico. Um, pretty much their religion was like a blend of Santeria and Satanism, I guess. And like some Christianity type stuff. Um, but anyways, it was like super fucking weird. And this was all happening at the same time. And these huge reports, there was this American that was killed by this cult that popped into the news as all of this was happening, giving more fuel to the fire that was like the Paul Ingram Thurston County case. Um, the American public now saw satanic ritual abuse because of this Matamoros discovery as 100% real. Immediately after the Matamoros news broke in the United States, an FBI investigator, a former effort FBI investigator, who claimed to be an expert on cult activity, went on Geraldo Rivera's show and claimed, I'd like to tell you right now, the next burial ground that we will learn about will be in Mason County, Washington. We've located a number of burial grounds up in Mason County, and they can't possibly go out and dig them all up. There are just too many of them. Mason County was right next door to Thurston County, and this agent was well aware of the Ingram case. This claim motivated law enforcement to engage in a full canvassing in the woods of Thurston County and the search of burial mounds, but no single burial site was found. While this bolstered the case of the defendants, it would end up costing the state, who did an exhaustive search using helicopters, private aircrafts, ground search teams, uh, night vision, thermal vision, all these other things, Around $3 million by the time it was officially closed. Jesus. It should be noted that while no uh, satanic burial grounds were ever found, uh, there was five or six uh, high school parties that were shut down. God damn it. Yep. <laughs> Trying to have some woodsies and they get <laughs> yeah, all shut happens. down, dude. <laughs> Fucking bummer, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Satanists ruin it for just, all of us. We're just here looking for Satanism, <laughs> but you guys got to go. All right. Facing even more pressure now, Vukic and Shoning press Paul for more names in the cult, trying to find someone that they could actually tie a crime to. Paul produced 10 new names throughout three days of disclosures, including members of the canine unit of the sheriff's department and detailed a, and described a scene in which police dogs had raped Sandy. The disclosure seemed to be the last straw that broke the sheriff's department's back. While many of the members of the sheriff's department had been willing to believe that Paul was telling the truth, they now decided that enough was enough. The common thinking was that Paul was pushing his disclosures 
to the absurd so that it was make his testimony worthless and not at all trustworthy. The case against Rish and Raby was also falling apart. The detectives had to finally ask themselves the question that they had refused to ever ask themselves before. What if these men hadn't done it? In an effort to spark some life back into defeated investigators, Neil McClanahan, all right, dude, you're, you're a sheriff here. You're the head of the sheriff's department. On May 1st, 1989, the trials of Jim Raby, Ray Rish, and Paul Grimm are scheduled to begin. The office was done a remarkable job in uncovering the first ritualistic abuse investigation that had been confirmed by an adult offender involved directly with the offenses in the nation's history. However, once the trials actually began, all charges of satanic abuse went by the wayside. They were just far too crazy to be proved as factual. Despite this, Paul Ingram still pled guilty to six charges of third-degree rape. Both Julie and Erica had written to him, telling him that they were owed at least that much for what he did. The sentencing for Ingram, however, would be delayed as Julie had apparently been sent a threatening letter. It read... Do you realize how much trouble you caused your family? You really blown this one, and to tell you the truth, you broke us up forever. You will never be a part of our family again. You do realize that there are many people that would like to see you dead, and a few that are hunting for you. Your ex-father, Paul. The problem with this letter was evident immediately. It was in Julie's handwriting. Oh, wow. (laughs) McClanahan excused Julie's behavior as that typical of abuse victims claiming she just wants us to believe her. Two days after Paul's guilty plea, the charges against Raby and Rish were dropped. They had been in custody for 158 days. Solitary. In mid-May. Jesus. Yeah. All three of them? No, no, no. Just Raby and... Paul was never, I mean, he was in jail, but I think, I don't think he was in solitary for whatever reason. I don't really know why, That's fucking weird. but the other two were half a year in solitary confinement. In mid-May of 1989, Dr. Richard Offshe pleaded with Paul to rescind his guilty plea before his sentencing. Paul admitting to, ha- Paul admitted to having doubts about his ability, his guilt. In mid-May of 1989, Dr. Richard Offshe pleaded with Paul to rescind his guilty plea before his sentencing. Paul admitted to having doubts about his guilty plea himself. However, he was still hopeful that in atoning for his sins, the memories would eventually come back to him. Richard Offshe assured him that this would never happen, claiming that he wouldn't ever be able to remember things that never happened. However, Paul remained steadfast in his guilt. Two months later, while in his cell, however, Paul came to the realization that this entire story had been a farce after writing down events into three columns, definitely happened, not so definitely happened, and not sure, jotting down his memories daily. He saw them begin to migrate from the first column, definitely happened, into the not so definitely happened and the not sure columns. Ingram got a new lawyer who filed a petition to withdraw his guilty plea on the grounds that he had been coerced by detectives into giving a false confession. This petition, this petition was rejected, however, and all his new lawyer could do was advocate for leniency after the sentencing hearing in April of 1990. At Paul's sentencing, Erica asked the judge to impose the greatest possible sentence. She claimed... I believe he will either kill me or Julie. He destroyed me and Julie's life and our entire family, and he doesn't care. He's obviously a very dangerous man. When the judge asked Paul if he had anything to say, he replied, Now you're Paul. I stand before you. I stand before God. I have never sexually abused my daughters. I am not guilty of these crimes. Despite this, Paul Ingram was sentenced to 20 years in prison. 
he would serve 15 of that 20 as the only man to ever be convicted and serve time in connection to the satanic panic. Erica still remains steadfast in her belief that all of this happened. Julie refuses to talk much about the incident since the mid-90s. I should take a second and say that I have the utmost respect and acknowledgement to the author Lawrence Wright and his book Remembering Satan, as it is the primary episode or the primary source for all of this story. Um, we're going to end this now. Uh, when I first started the case, I was like, hell yeah, dude. Fucking devil is alive in Thurston County, Washington. But as we close this case, I am way more bummed out because not only was this case ridiculously depressing, I have come to the belief that the devil and Paul Ingram were like totally not chill. Mm -hmm. And I think that none of that, none of this happened. And that's the saddest part. I don't think that there's anything to do with the devil. I think in this, this case. is, I think this is like crazy. Definitely follows in a family. I think 100%. everyone, everyone in this family is fucking nuts. There's no, there's no way to believe any, any person. In this case, I guess Paul Ingram got sentenced to 15 years of prison because he and admitted it. And he maintains it. his innocence to the day. Well, he didn't in the during the trial, and that's why he's the only one that was convicted. Yep. Everyone else, like Ray Rich, did he go to jail? No. Well, I mean, technically. He went for the 120 days. His, like, you know, because they wouldn't let him out on, they would not let Raby or Rish out on bail. Yeah. And they waited in prison for 150 days in and solitary then confinement. Were, and then they were released. Correct. Yeah, this whole shit. Have you looked up, like, is there anything, like, where are they now? It's like a VH1 on anything? You know, you know maybe that's maybe that's uh, the follow-up episode. We kind of no, get a little detail. we're not doing a no, follow-up. No, we'll do a fourth episode about the, uh, we'll catch up with everyone. Maybe we'll get Paul on, dude. I'll call him real quick. Hey, <laughs> hey Siri. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, I think that this case is unique. And it's obscurity. I think that there's a whole lot of the case that like it's impossible to get to the bottom of this. No, that's why it never has been solved. I think that it's a wonderful story about maybe, you know, right around the same time we have like, you know, the West Memphis three and we have. Well, it's not, no, the West Memphis three was the nineties. Yeah. This is in This was before. This was before. This was 1988. We're all in the heat of the satanic panic, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So, like, I feel like you do know how time works. You just being mean right now? No, you know? Just because just you're like, it's 1998. And I'm like, no, I think it's 1988. Like, well, this is the Paul's same time. So, we're into the 90s here. I'm just saying, there's definitely some significant issues, I think, with the entire case. <laughs> no um, shit. The police have their theory and they don't let any evidence sway them from that theory. And I think that that's like the number one mistake you can make as a cop is like making up your mind on the first part and not letting anything deter you from that. Yeah. Um, do I think that there were potentially, I don't know, I guess, I don't know. Do you think that there were traumas that these girls experienced or is this all just made up trying to get attention? I don't know. Honestly, I want to like side with them being the victims. Sure. Cause that's like how your, your brain and like your heart want to do. But like some of the things that were written, like seem farce, yeah. but also like <clears throat> everything from Paul Ingram seems made up too. Dude, it's, it's all fucking nuts. But like, that's the thing is like Paul is making or like, his statements are just as incriminating as the girls are, if 100%. not more so. Yes. And like, it just makes you question what's like, what is he do? Like, what is he getting out of this? Like, is he trying to like relieve some guilt or is there like some part of him that is whatever you want to call it, a true believer that like, God can only like, he can only see these things because they've happened because God wouldn't like they said in the, like his pastor had told him 
you can only see things that have happened because God wouldn't let you see false things. Well, then why would he change his mind in prison after conviction? Because he knows that it's all bullshit. So... Like, why would you confess to all... I mean, like, why I, would you, I get it, though. Like, if you're confessing to all these things, thinking, and, like, maybe they're right. Like, maybe the escalation of his own confessions are just a way for him to almost discredit himself. And being like, yo, that dude's straight up crazy. We can't take any of his testimony real. But they fucking did, and they fucking nailed him on it. And they're all fu- They're all nuts. They're crazy people. Yeah. That's my, like, final thought. That's why there's never been a case like this. Yeah. And the only one convicted during the state panic because literally not a single one of them could do or could tell a single like truth. Yeah, because it's it's all just in their head, this uh-huh. entire thing. And like maybe things these things happen and they've learned to compartmentalize it with the girls or the sons or whatever. And like, you know, even like we talked about in the earlier episodes, like Ray Rish and Jim Raby, like even like maybe we're like on unsure of like, Oh, did these things happen? Like maybe I like did do something bad. Now they, they, they took those back after a while, but like at the same time, like when those things first happened, they were like, maybe I did it. And I think that this case is like, as a product of its own environment as as you can get it's the satanic panic it's the rise in uh i want to call it like developments in psychology and sociology cult thought and repressed memories all of these things that are i don't want to say pseudosciences but like really like are a little bit more fringy type things like memory repression is not proven to be a real thing over continuous time. Like one or two events, they say that like you can repress those things. But when it happens, uh, I think she said that it was like 50 to a hundred times. Like you don't repress that. Yeah. And Paul himself regard, like regarded himself. He's like, Oh yeah. Like I had two personalities and like one of them just couldn't deal with what the other one was doing. So he just block them off. And I think that like, uh, that's just not true. No, they're all full of shit. I think that's where we end it. <laughs> all right. So thank you so much for listening into this three part. Um, please. We're if so you, happy we finally fucking finished this. If you, if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't enjoy it, please like and subscribe. Um, so good work, dude. What do we? What's next? What's the next topic, Pete? We haven't decided on the next topic yet. Uh, depending on when this comes out, I think it's time for like a little listener engagement here. If you guys want to see us cover some topics. I don't think anyone's going to ask us. You know who you We're, are. You're going to have to plan this, but way before that. Send, Some, send in requests. We want to hear good stories. If right. you've got a good one, send it to us. We'll look at it. All right. Well, thank you. See ya. Cheers, fuckers. Cheers. Let's go. Drink down those demons. Bye.